Let's talk some Facebook ads today, shall we? What's up, my friends? Rick here. Today's episode of the Art of Online Business podcast is with my good friend, and he's also an accelerator coach. His name is Quajo. He was actually in Accelerator as a member several years ago, and he's been a coach for me inside the program for a few years now. And just a super, super smart person, just an amazing person overall. And he specializes in Facebook ads. And also one thing that that separates him from, from other Facebook ad managers, I think, is his ability to go deep on analytics and to be able to show you actually what's working and use those analytics to make decisions about what to do with your ad campaigns. Also, he knows online business, so he's able to use the analytics of your funnel, et cetera, to help you make your ads succeed. And I invited him on the show to here today to talk to you about what's working right now with Facebook ads. And I will tell you, you are probably going to be disappointed because teaser, it's not some flashy, you know, super, you know, ha you know, funnel hack or anything like that. This is tried and true what's working today. So if you do this, what you what you're about to hear today, you are setting yourself up for success with your Facebook ads. And, and listen, the prevailing sentiment about Facebook ads, especially over the past couple of years is that or do they still work? Absolutely. Especially when you do the things that you're about to hear today. And also towards the end of the episode here with Quajo, we get pretty tactical about the things that you can do right now in, you know, as you're setting up your campaign and, and you're going to hear more here today. We do get very tactical with it later on in the episode. So without further ado, let's talk about what's happening right now and what's working right now with Facebook ads with Quajo. So I think I want to start this conversation off with you, Quajo. What types of clients do you primarily work with to sort of add context to what we're going to be talking about here today for Facebook ads? So for context, I work mainly with the kind of clients that you work with, specifically online course creators, and a few online coaches, mainly online course creators. And they're usually around the 200K revenue mark okay. minimum and going up to around 800K annual revenue. What are they primarily trying to accomplish with their ads? Are they just you know list building? Are they running ads to a membership? Are they running ads to a webinar? Are they running ads to a paid offer? Or is it a little bit across the board? What are they trying to accomplish or what do they need to accomplish? <laughs> what are they trying to accomplish? And we're going to talk about that distinction here as we go here. It is, it is a bit across the board. What I see right now is actually a good number of funnels where they're running to like an evergreen campaign. So if I back up somebody using an, a pre-recorded webinar and trying to sell something, they're, they're generating leads and they're hoping to make sales out of that, but they're really generating sure. leads. I would classify that still as a, a lead magnet. So we have a few that are strictly lead generation. Most fall into the, they're either having a funnel, starting with a lead magnet that mm -hmm. have a, an offer on the back of that funnel, what we call a tripwire. Mm -hmm. And then another one that is running ads to a pre-recorded webinar. And then another one that's running ads directly to a membership. So kind of across the board directly to sign up for the membership. Yeah. So one of the things that distinguishes you from most other ad managers is you put a lot of emphasis on the analytics and the mm -hmm. data and incorporating that. And it sounds so obvious, right? But yet most people don't do it. Most ad managers don't do it, unfortunately, where there is a big piece of the service that you provide is the analytics part. And I, and I want to talk about a little bit later on, but just as an example, I know that, and, and by the way, you all like, so Quajo is a coach in my accelerator coaching program. And yep. one of the things that he specializes in, in addition to, you know, sort of general business coaching 
is is the ads and so he has calls with you know the different accelerators they get to sign up for times with him and so forth and he had an instance and again i want to talk about this later on but he had an instance recently where after well it will break it down but as you looked into it there, yeah. what what you found was lead costs were actually three dollars lower yep than the person thought they were that's huge that's, that's huge yeah. yeah. So just because of the analytics and we'll, t we'll come back to that, but I just wanted to sort of set the stage here. Now, what do you see right now? We're recording this three weeks into March, 2022, right now, 2023, excuse me. What are you seeing that's working right now when it comes to ads? The simplest answer is well researched ad copy. I was at a mastermind a couple of weeks ago and I heavily encourage everyone who was there listening to me just to take the time to get to understand who they are serving with their offer what are their pains what are their struggles what are they what are they whining about you know because it's one thing to have a struggle in a business or a or an issue but it's how are you complaining about that struggle and then i tell them the same thing that i do which is invest either their own time in understanding who they're serving and writing good ad copy or just pay a copywriter, not just any copywriter, but somebody who actually knows how to write ad copy and do the research. Because for my clients, that's what really gets the low lead cost. Because when somebody reads their ad, they feel, they feel like they're hurt. They feel like you're quote unquote in their head. And it's because you've done your job seeing what they struggle with and you can help them with your offer by explaining your offer in light of their struggles. Well, I'm joking by saying this, but I'm also very serious. Nobody wants to hear that as the answer to what's working right now. Everybody wants to seriously, everybody wants to hear like, like some trick or, you know, some secret sauce or, you know, a special setting in ads manager or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. It's I wish there was a trick even somebody said this when i was giving a little a little presentation they're like quajo you always say you're going to have to test that it's like i'm an ads manager a good ads manager. yeah right test the different features but yeah. that, that's true rick it's it's the ad copy so as i've said here on the on the podcast here and, and you know i've talked about this too is that the ad creative meaning the image or the video or carousel whatever you're doing there and the copy is the new targeting. And I say new in quotes because it's really frankly been that way for the last couple of years. But the targeting aspect, because the algorithm, the you know, Facebook's AI that's running in the background of our ads has become so, so good, the targeting is less and less important. I mean, when we recommend the people, you know, test out, hey, target all of us you know men and women between hey, just open everything up mm -hmm. they you know this is something that we would never do years ago yeah. when 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 setting up our ads but that's something that because the you know facebook's algorithm is so good at finding the people you have to do your part in putting together as you just said quajo like creative that speaks to your target audience so that you can, that Facebook's algorithm can find those people based on the creative who you're trying to attract mm -hmm. within the open targeting. Mm -hmm. And I will say, even though I look at client accounts daily, the fact that we can have a broad open audience targeted at the countries that we usually target and targeted at the age group of people that we know usually mm -hmm. purchase an offer, or versus a client's offer, it really is amazing to see that those audiences, because I have several client accounts where those are the audiences that are performing. And I guess if someone's looking for one, one hack, and it's not a big hack, but I would say I don't have many clients now that have an ad set with only one ad in it. That's the best performing ad. Usually there's two or three ads running in an ad set. Mm -hmm. And you know what? From day to day, performance of those individual ads may change. But then I'm looking at the cost per lead for the ad set. 
to hold steady. How much can we trust the the data though in Ads Manager in terms of you know cost per lead? I don't trust it <laughs> at all. So, so what are you doing? You know, what are you doing instead? So, all right, we can look at the data, right? The ad, ma ad manager, and I, I've talked about, done whole episodes on, you know, what I call like triangulating the data, looking at what, what ad manager is saying, et cetera. So if you're saying that you don't trust the, the data in ads manager, what it's telling you, what are you doing instead? Google Analytics, Google Analytics, and I won't say the third time for emphasis, but you get the point. Inside of Facebook ad manager, you can, and I do daily, look at, you know, what are lead costs today? What were they yesterday? And what were they, you know, over a range of a couple of days before that? Just to see any trends comparing, let's say, oranges to oranges or blue apples to blue apples. But if you want to know your lead cost, we probably should circle around to that that story of a coaching call that I was yeah, on. Yeah, why don't, why, don't, why don't we go there? So this person, you were working with this person and what were they asking about? So they were asking... First, it was just help them look at their funnel and see, well, help them look at their ads and see how their ads were performing. Mm -hmm. And so I started asking some questions and, you know, we had been coaching together for a couple of weeks. So this more was just a ads are already running. Check in, please, Quajo. And so I checked in and I happened to ask them, okay, we see the ad cost here, but what does Google Analytics say? It's like a deer in headlights. I'm like, yeah. our last call, I asked you to set it up. Did you set it up yet? Okay, so we did it together. And then we came back to the call that we're talking about now. And what we saw was she had set up Google Analytics, but she wasn't looking at it. So when I showed her how to look at it, literally what you do, it's really simple. You take the, for a specific time range, you take the ad spend from Facebook, and then you look at that same time range in Google Analytics, and you look at the number of leads. Because as of the recording of this video, March 20th, 2023, we can still trust Google Analytics to give accurate lead data because their tracking is magical. And <laughs> what I found was that her cost per lead went down $3. It's not always good news when you start looking at Google Analytics. But for right. her, possibly it was three dollars lower yeah, than what huge. she's seeing inside of Ads Manager. And as you know, Rick, that for an automated evergreen webinar could yeah. that's that's significant. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it is and I know that, you know, from a since we're talking on the podcast here, it's gonna be maybe hard to picture, but most people think that setting up Google Analytics for our ads is a you know, big undertaking from what I just heard from you. It's not, that's not the case or it doesn't have to be the case. It doesn't have to be it. I coach people through it on sure. Facebook ads, coaching calls. It yep. can be as simple and can be depending on you know what landing page software, it can be as simple as just taking the Google analytics ID and plugging that into your landing page software. Like, lead pages, for example, you can just plug in the ID and then you have that tracking on whatever landing page you plug in the ID to. If you, if you use WordPress, it gets a little more complicated depending sure. on the plugin, but it's really not that complicated. Where people get stuck is the interface, which is not friendly in Google Analytics. But once somebody shows you yeah. one or two times, especially if they give you a recording of your call, how to set up Google Analytics and all you're mainly doing conceptually, just like the Facebook pixel is you're installing Google Analytics on your thank you page. If it's installed on your website, the important lead data is still coming from how many people are hitting that thank you page after they've opted in. And so once somebody takes the time to install it, they'll, they'll be happy either because their cost per leads are lower than what they saw. <laughs> Unfortunately, many people will see their cost per lead go up because it's just how it is. Because Facebook's under-reporting. Because Facebook's under-reporting and it, it's sad. But 
if you have the real data, then you have a point, you reconcile where your funnel is really at, and then you start to work with that and tweak what you need to tweak to get a better cost per lead. Do people need to set up a goal in analytics in order to see this spit like this data for this specific campaign that they might be running? So in what many people call Google Analytics 3, which is correctly called, and I made the mistake myself plenty of times, universal analytics. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that's going away in July. We're all going to be forced to use Google Analytics 4. And from what I understand, that is a true, that is a true hard deadline, right? They're not going to report. Yeah, I've heard this. I've heard the same thing. Yeah, we have to be moved over to GA4 by July. I don't know the specific date in July, but yeah, it's happening. It Right. So it's a hard deadline for everybody that's listening. Please take it seriously. It's not like when you have an operating system on your Mac and you don't upgrade, you can still keep using it and it works to move the Google Analytics for. The reason I said that, Rick, was because in Universal Analytics, it's called a goal. Inside of Google Analytics 4, everything is now more event-based. So you're setting up an event and then calling it a conversion and then finding the way Google Analytics 4 to view that data. I laugh because it is kind of a pain in the neck, but that's that's what you do. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So this person, it, like it was $3 lower. Mm-hmm. Once they realize that, what does that inform them to do next? Or does it, does it, you know, what, what are you doing with that information? other than celebrating the fact that your, you know, <laughs> your CPL is a lot lower. Right? Well, for this person and anyone who has a funnel, right? You have to look at it holistically. The goal, hopefully, well, the goal is generally to be profitable. So sure. you have a lead that comes into your funnel and once they see whatever you're offering them of value, be that a lead magnet or a webinar or some training, even a workshop, at the end of the funnel, that lead is worth more because they've purchased your offer. Well, if now we know that a lead costs $3 less, that basically means that we're $3 closer to profitability or $3 more profitable. It depends on a lot of the other factors in the funnel. Sure. Now you talk a lot about maximizing the leads and we wanna just, preface this conversation, we fully understand a lead is a person. So when people are coming into your funnel, what are you looking at in order to maximize those leads, if you will, or, you know, make them more valuable? Help the most people as possible. How about that? There we go. Right. It does come down to that. Like we use these terms that can seem really cold and really salesy, but ultimately like like you always say, Rick, selling is serving. Mm-hmm. Like if I have an offer that really does help people in whatever niche I'm in, then why would I not want to serve the highest number of people possible? Sure. Yep. So what are we looking at inside of a funnel? Yeah, in order to maximize. So if, you know, just as an example, let's use the example we just talked about where this person lowered their you know, lead cost by $3. Okay, great. We now have that information, but that's just one, as you mentioned, that's just one data point in the, Mm -hmm. in the overall funnel. So what are, you know, what are you doing and what are you working with your clients on when looking to make those, make the leads, if you will, more valuable? So, I mean, since I've coached with you inside of Accelerator. I've come to borrow the term that you use called leverage, or you're looking at sure. points of leverage in the funnel, the pieces in the funnel where it's clearly the easiest thing that you should change to increase your conversion rate. One place I usually go to first is just the opt-in page, not with a template, like an opt-in page must look a certain way, mm-hmm. but just asking the question, what is the conversion rate? on the opt-in page out of a hundred people who go to look at it, how many of those people opt in? Yeah. And then, you know, we can begin to look at standard things that the opt-in page should have. Like, is there, is the value of whatever they're offering really clear? Do they accurately, or at least 
in a way that's congruent with what their audience is struggling with convey these pain points? Do they have a call to action button that you can click on because you could see it because it's not so artfully designed that it blends into the color palette of the, and you said it a lot, of the, of the opt-in page. I have to see? pause you right there. Like we, we, we kind of like, we kind of laugh a little bit, but, but you all, this is the, one of the biggest things I see when I'm looking at landing pages and, you know, doing any kind of analysis or what have you, this, I, I feel like I say it 80 times a day, but it still happens all the time. Your call to action button color needs to be yeah. a different color than all the other colors on your page. So if there's a lot of blue on your page, for example, don't have a blue call to action button color because it blends in with the rest of the blue. It sounds so obvious, but I see this all the time. And you know, if you want to keep it within your brand colors, great. Just pick a brand color that you're not really using on the page. And, you know, so the idea is just to have a consistent call to action color that when people see it, like, oh, okay, I'm going to be clicking on that. It's, it's a very simple thing, but again, you know, and I'm not talking about, I'm, what we're not talking about here is split testing, you know, change, let's change the cut, the color of the button. No, no, no. We're just saying, Hey, start off with, Make sure that you're the 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 color of the call the action button of like register now or whatever is different and separates itself from the rest of the color on the page. Yeah, and when you look at an opt-in page, somebody should be able to go there and clearly know they came there for a reason, right? They shouldn't be able to see the opt-in page and clearly know what is being offered of value, why they should get it, which actually are different things, right? Yeah. You know, and then how to get it. And I was looking at somebody else's page last week and there were, th it wasn't clear what, I wasn't clear, even as a marketer looking at the page, what I should do. Should I join this person's email list? Should I buy this person's book? And then I think there also was a call to action to work with this person all on the same page mm. thinking, if I'm not clear as somebody who looks at tons of opt-in pages, how does somebody else feel for the first time when they hear this person on a podcast, wonderful value is offered. They click through to see how they can work with them, but then they have some videos that are placed there, everything of value, right? But sure. just not a logical order that really guides somebody to the right action. And again, if serving is selling, if selling is serving, then I want to make sure that I can clearly let somebody buy my offer so I can serve them. I have an analogy. You ready? I'm ready. I want to hear it. So I lived in China for 12 years. One of the intriguing things about China is when you go to the supermarket, your senses are just overwhelmed because there's tons of different signs. There's flashing lights all these bright colors and think of like a bazaar but just on steroids however you're in a walmart and the layout what i wanted to, what i wanted to share is the layout sometimes you'll have walmarts that are like three or four stories and you come in one door but then you have to go down no joke where i first lived for five years in china you have to go down into the basement first walk around and then there's another escalator that takes you back up to the first floor the first floor that you entered on and then you can see the rest of the store that's on the first floor then you can take another escalator up to the second floor and to the third floor before taking an escalator back down to another section of the first floor and buying something and it's the most confusing the first time you do it it's the most confusing shopping experience Right, Sounds awful. It, it is awful. No offense to Chinese listeners. Like, it's just not intuitive, and you feel really confused on the inside when you walk through there. And I get the logic. We want you to see everything in the store. I'm sure, mm -hmm. every store wants you to see all that. Sure. But then let's compare that with, I don't know, a Kroger if you're on the East Coast, or a CVS if you're on the East Coast, or a Fred Meyer or a Safeway, where in general. When you walk in, it's open 
And yes, they put a ton of time into what they expect you to see. And they've researched, the research is really scary, actually. They've researched how they want you to walk around and what path you're supposed to take that gets you to buy the most things. And they have you taking this path. But in general, things are open. It's not that hard to go all the way back to the end and grab your milk and then come out to the cash register because you only needed that one thing. And landing pages should be like that. Whatever you're presenting, it should be very clear. When somebody sees it, it should be a refreshing, ah, you know, it should be designed well with some good white space and call to action buttons that are easy to see. Yeah. I, I mean, just can't, re- can't, you know, reiterate this enough that this is, it sounds so simple, but yet so many people don't do it and it's affecting their ads. So, yeah. all right, landing page, what kind of conversion rate are you looking for on the landing page? If it's cold traffic, I'm looking for right around 30%. If I see 15% cold traffic, something's very wrong, usually the messaging. If they're hitting a home run, let's say 60% of cold traffic, I want to just give them, you know, the golf clap. <laughs> if you can't see the video, if you're only listening to the podcast, I'm doing the golf clap right now. However, Sometimes I wonder if the targeting could be too too broad, if the messaging might not be narrow enough. But yeah, right around 30% would be what I would expect to see for cold traffic on the opt-in page. Okay, so let's say somebody is getting 30% mm-hmm. on the opt-in page. What do we do? What are you recommending and, and what are you doing with your clients to, to go, you know, what's next? Again, all with the intention of making those, maximizing the leads, making them as valuable as possible. Right. And that's, it's so important. And that's why I work with clients on this because a lot of ad managers, they are great at getting the leads, but then unfortunately, if a client doesn't have their funnel in order, they're still not going to be making much money. And it also kind of reflects poorly on the ads manager because we tend to get blamed because we can't wave a magic wand and make the rest right. of someone's business work yeah. well. Right. So Let's say this client has a evergreen webinar because that's like the holy grail, right, Rick? Um, Everybody wants that. Everybody wants that. Then money's falling from the sky and they're sitting on, you know, the the beach in their chair and have a drink and, you know, yeah, totally. Exactly. So the next step after the opt-in page, they're opting in for an evergreen webinar, then they're probably going to either watch that webinar on the thank you page or on some sort of software. Okay. So Mm. the next indicator of the health of the funnel could very well be how many people, what percentage of people are showing up to that webinar. And the number I'm looking for would be 25 to 30%. And so again, we might have a healthy opt-in rate, but sales aren't good, we go to the webinar show up rate step and it turns out that 3% of the people that are opting in are showing up to the webinar. Well, then Rick, what did we look at? Yeah. 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 Why aren't people, why aren't people showing up? Yeah, exactly. Are there emails in place? Are you scheduling too far in advance? Mm -hmm. Are you limiting the number of days that you can, that you can schedule? Yeah. All these things. Yeah. Do you have a good thank you page that clearly outlines the next steps? Yeah. There, there's there's so many things, but it it really, I just want to encourage anybody who's listening who might have a fledgling funnel or be thinking about building a funnel out. Number one, if you're making sales in your business, you already have a funnel, whether you know it or not. You just have to start to look at the the logical steps to where somebody could take another step closer to doing business with you. And the number two, if you have a funnel and you're like, oh my gosh, this sounds so overwhelming. Opt-in page, thank you page, show up rates, emails. Step by step, one yeah. step at a time. Look for like the standard numbers that you should be seeing. And then look at the part of the funnel, which is just the worst, where it's very clear this bucket has a gaping hole in it. How do I fix it? And then if you're not coaching with somebody like me, start with YouTube, you know, there's plenty of free knowledge out there too, to help to learn how to do these things. I I think that this is, you know, in addition to the data and and the analytics and so forth, this is another thing that separates you 
when you're managing people's ads because a lot of ad managers won't do that work, meaning looking at, because they can be driving in expensive leads, right? And mm -hmm. as far as as far as the ads manager is concerned, if that's what the goal is, they're accomplishing that. But most people, you know, most people hiring an ads manager are like, no, I want, I want you to run my ads. I want you to get me profitable ads, they'll say. And, sure. you know, but oftentimes, as you mentioned earlier, is the funnel is broken. Something's mm -hmm. not working there. But you know, you, you and I have been working together for years and you're able to go into, just like you're talking about right now, go into, okay, you're getting the ads, right? You're doing the ads part, but then if something's broken, if something's not working, you're able to go into the rest of the funnel and inquire and find out, ah, this, you know, let's do, you know, this could be an issue here. Let's test something new. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've had, I've been fortunate to work with you over the years and see you do it time and time again and show people how to think about their funnel funnel. Yeah. So I can completely understand and I'm not knocking on ads managers. If you're paid to be an ads manager and you manage ads well, ads management is not easy. First of all, there's so many courses that you could see come across like your Instagram feed, but it's not easy to yeah. manage ads. So anybody that manage, manages ads well, that's really good. It's just that online business owners tend to have this expectation that, oh, if I get good leads, then I'll just make sales. And it's not that simple. There's the funnel after the ads. So, so, if, the, so if the show up rate is good, let's mm -hmm. just say they're getting a you know 30% show up rate. Yeah. But still not profit, like still not the funnel's still not converting well from a from a sales perspective. Mm -hmm. Where do you go next? I look at that thing of that, well, we're talking about show up rate, so it must be a webinar. So the next step is to actually look at the webinar, um, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother yeah. topic. Yeah, we're not, which we're not gonna dive into on, on this one, but yes, absolutely looking at looking at the webinar. What specifically are you, are you looking at? What would you just say? You know, the first really simple thing to look at and really simple, just means it's it's very clear if you use webinar software that tracks the percentage of the webinar that your viewers are watching. Yeah. The really, really simple place to look is what percentage of people are watching when you start selling, when the pitch starts, so to speak. Yeah. Um, actually, that is pretty straightforward, but here's another one that I see <laughs> you, Rick, talk about and ask the length of the webinar. If the webinar is two hours, Unless you yeah. have really people probably aren't watching to the point where you offer how they or where you share how they can work with you. So looking at the web webinar link overall and saying, okay, three hour webinar, we probably should get that webinar underneath an hour. But then yeah, just aside, looking at the percentage of people that are actually watching when you make that offer towards the end of your webinar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to circle back to, because, because as we're, I mean, and we can spend, you know, an entire episode and maybe we should do this, but an entire episode on the funnel aspect itself, because, but, but what I want you all to take away of what Quajo is talking about here is you're looking at, because it can be really overwhelming to look at the entire funnel as a whole and just mm -hmm. be like, well, where do I even start with this? What Quajo is doing here is breaking down each piece of the funnel as somebody would go through it. And so, you know, starting with the landing page conversion rate, if it's a 15% conversion rate, like Quaja was saying, well, there's some, some issue going on there. If it's, if it's good. And so it's like, you stop there and deal with that before moving on. If it's 30%, okay, cool. You can kind of sort of, you know, in so many aspects, check that box, if you will, now move to the next element of the, the, the funnel in this, this example here that we're talking about, it's a webinar funnel. Okay, cool. Well, how many people are showing up? And then again, if this, then that, right? If it's good, you know, if, you, if you're checking that box, cool, move on to the next thing. All right. If that's good and people are, people still aren't buying. All right, look, okay, let's look at how long people are, you know, and just that's the point here is you're looking at each aspect of the, of the funnel and stopping and this is where most people get overwhelmed because they they don't they say okay this is i need to fix this and then i also need to fix these five other things 
And so that's overwhelming. Okay. It's like yeah. just do one thing at a time. I want to go back to your research process. Okay. Because when I asked you, I said, what was the, you know, what is working right now with ads? You didn't say, oh, do, you know, carousels or lead ads or this or that or some special setting. You said the research process, which again, mm -hmm. most people don't want to hear that, you know, because that's not new. That's not super fun. Most people don't want to do that. And also most people will say, I know my target audience. Yes. Talk about that. I know my target audience. That is literally why after, and disclaimer, I am not a copywriter. I pay a professional copywriter who mm -hmm. I trained in my research process for mm -hmm. ad copy to write the ad copy for me sure. and for my clients. But literally because clients say they know, and usually they do, right? Because I'm working with, established online businesses. I have a disclaimer in the email too, when I give them their first round of ad copy that says, you probably use different words from the ones you're seeing in the ad copy. However, this research process took about 11 hours and definitely reflects, you know, your target audience and their hopes and aspirations and their struggles as found in a myriad of different places around the internet, including on your social media. And so, that whole speech is inside of the email to kind of put the client's brain in the right space when they look at the ad copy and maybe see words that they're not used to seeing. And so I always suggest, look, make a few tweaks, but let's trust the process and put the ads to work and see what the cost per leads are like and then decide. And many, not everyone, but many people are surprised. So, the research process. Yeah. Should we give a simple one that somebody could do on their own or do you yes. just want to hear what my copywriter does? Yeah. Well, let's start um, with the Like what can people do on their own? Because most people are not going to want to do 11 hours of, of research. Let's face it. But what, but what like is... Anything, <laughs> yeah. Like anything in life, putting in the time does help. But right. if you're doing this on your own, where I would start is what am I offering of value? Okay. Let's say it's a course on how to train your dog. I don't want to stop with what I'm offering of value. I want to know who possibly really wants to buy from me. And of those people, like, who am I actually trying to work with? That's important, right? Because there could be, you know, a young person with no kids that has this little yappy Pomeranian, or there could be people who are using dogs for, what are those, what are they called? People that have special needs, like they're oh, a service dog. Yeah. A service dog, right? Yeah. It's two different audiences with two completely different pain points. Okay. So what am I offering of value? Who is, could buy from me and who do I actually want to do business with? And then what mm -hmm. are their struggles, so to speak? Those three simple things. Okay, so with those, let's call them filters, then if I'm doing this myself, I'm going to the internet now and finding out where those kind of people are and what they're saying as far as what they're saying when they don't think anybody's really paying attention. This could be comments on a YouTube video that has a subject that's related to what I'm selling. Mm. Frequently, what I've seen, though, because my copywriter, you know, I, I can see her research. Forums. Forums are glorious. What's that one called? Reddit, where people just love to complain. Oh, yeah. You go to Reddit and search and find out a whole slew of, let's call it information, as in what people have tried, other products that people have tried, all the reasons they don't like those products, all the things they wish something would do. Or just they're looking for help with their, let's say, with their own pet. Um, sure. I am a dog person. And you can, you can gather that. And so you just gather it into a document. That document could have a Reddit section, a YouTube section. You've gone to Amazon.com and you've looked for some dog training books. And then you look at the reviews for those books. Because if somebody wants to train their dog, okay, what are they saying about the book? What did the book help them do? What didn't it help them do? You just start to gather all that in one document. Mm -hmm. 
Then you have another document and you kind of reorganize that into some themes. What themes do you pick? Well, you go back to, again, what am I selling? Who is buying it? And, and of the people that could buy it, who am I really trying to work with? Because if you're trying to work with everyone, you're really going to work with no one. You need to have a focus within your niche. And then what are their struggles? And if you just look at that, you can very quick, well, not very quickly, but rather easily, rather simply, I think it's simple, begin to pull an ad together. And the ad doesn't have to be super complicated. Like how people that struggle with one thing go to the ultimate goal that my product offers without all the struggles that you've researched, you know? How dog owners with super yappy dogs go to being able to walk their three Pomeranians around the hallway without any barking, you know, without having to pay $600 for an A-lister dog trainer that's going to come to their house. And there you have the beginnings of an ad and you kind of further outline their struggles. You outline how you can help them and you have a call to action. And that is a simple process, Rick, that I could tell I would yeah. tell, I do tell anybody to do, and it really would help their ads. So when, when you're testing mm -hmm. your, your ads, what is the first thing that you are testing? The first thing. There's three things. So I'm going to take ad copy, put it inside of an ad set. Ad set is an audience. Mm -hmm. The first thing I'm testing inside of one audience is just which ad copy performs the best. I always start with three. Always? Can I say always? I can say always. I actually do always start with three for my clients. I want to see which ad copy works the best first. So okay. same, same. If it's, if you're testing, are you testing ad, the ad type at all? So image versus video versus carousel? No, because the first step is my copywriter would provide me with three pieces of ad copy. Mm -hmm. I want to figure out which one is the best because the copywriter, what they've done is they've researched, right? And then because of a few other factors, they've decided of this persona that they've developed through research, which is the theme that we're going to speak to this person on to show them that we can help them. Mm -hmm. So I want to figure out which of those themes, which of those different ad copy is working the best and then I'll worry about pairing a video with it or pairing an image with it. So ad copy first and then creative for me. So what would you do you just, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to test these different three different versions of, of copy with the hooks and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are you just putting up, like, are you just going to put up a, an image ad, an image with it that's so, relevant to the copy? I'll put the best creative with it mm -hmm. that the client can give me and that I can modify. For example, if the client only has great images of dogs, if yeah. you know, then I'll probably add some text to that image and make it a graphic. So I should say I'm going to start with a video or a graphic. But the key here is, is when I'm testing, I want to test one variable at a time. So Whichever creative I choose, it's going to be a, a good one. One that I believe has a chance of success. It's sure. going to be the same creative paired with three different pieces of ad copy so that after several days, I can see which piece of ad copy is doing well. Then I can try some other creative. And then I can, if I need to, because frequently what I find is in the first couple of iterations, cost per lead is already coming in well below what it was before or just well within range of where it needs to be. Yeah. But if I needed to, then I would start to test another audience and see how the winning ad copy plus creative combination in the current audience performed in a different audience, if needed. Last question on that, as we start to wrap up, everybody okay. wants to know, well, wait, how, do, how long am I testing this for? <laughs> Oh, you have to test the length of the like of the testing that you're doing. <laughs> Three to five days. Three days is is pretty short. But if everything, if the factors, the variables in your ad are on point, you can tell that in three days. 
if something is really off, then you can also see that. After five days, you got enough data. I like to tell people, at least my clients, they sort of have to listen to me since they're trusting and paying me. <laughs> I go into their account and start their ads when I feel like, which would be as early in the week as possible and mm. as early in the morning as possible. Because though it doesn't feel that way, and this is just more like a word of encouragement to anyone listening, though it doesn't feel like Facebook ads are working on our behalf, Facebook still wants us as business owners to make money through their ad product so that they can continue to sure. be viable as a business. And so their algorithm, whatever that means to you, is working and optimizing on your behalf. And so if you give it more data with which to optimize, like Rick was sharing about broader audiences, but also then what I was just saying, starting your ads earlier in the week, since a Facebook user's behavior varies vastly between Monday through Friday, the workday, and then on the weekend. So start your ads as early in the week as you can, and then try to give your ads a full day's worth of data. So, I mean, I'm speaking and working with people who are in the States usually. Mm -hmm. Start your ad early in the morning. That way, from the person who's getting up, you know, to getting their kids to school, to that first cup of coffee, committing to work, not committing to work. Do not look at your phone when you're in the car. <laughs> at work, we can get all their behavior and the algorithm can begin to optimize that ad on the ad for you. And three to five days, you should be able to see how performance is doing and begin to make decisions on that. So... I'll definitely have you back on here because we need to continue this because we can talk about, I mean, as, <laughs> as you and I know, and everybody listening right now there, they know that I can talk ads forever and as can you. So we'll have you back on to continue the conversation when it comes to ads. And I just want to kind of recap, cause we did cover a lot of things here today. So, you know, when, when it comes to what's working right now with ads, it's nothing new. It's nothing flashy. It's the research process. It is knowing your target audience. What are they, what are they struggling with? Mm -hmm. And just getting very specific on that and putting the work into that research process. If you're just doing 30 minutes of research, it's not going to be enough, right? And you can get ads going, but you're not setting yourself up for the most success possible when you're not doing that research process. We talked about analytics. We talked about the, the necessity these days of, look, the data in ads manager is not frankly to be trusted. And so we need another data source yeah. that we can look at. And you, Quajo, look, and I agree, like you use Google analytics and it's not that, you know, it's not that difficult to set up. Sometimes you'll be very surprised <laughs> on both sides, whether it's <laughs> either lower or higher than what you once thought. So analytics and having the data for it, you know, right in front of you that you can easily access to be able to look at the, the true health of your ads and your funnel is going to be critical. And then we also talk about how do we maximize those, you know, the, the, the leads, the people coming into your funnel, what are the things that we need to be looking at in order to be getting the most out of the money that we're putting in to bring them into the funnel? And, mm -hmm. and really just breaking it down step by step. Any closing thoughts on that that I, maybe I didn't hit there? You covered everything. My closing remarks would be, please take your analytics seriously. Make sure your dollars are being well spent. Install Google Analytics for the deadline is July 1st, 2023. And the wording is universal analytics will no longer process new data. So please take the time to do that. Please take the time to set it up. And then please take the time to, to just learn about your audience. Yeah. Super critical. Where it can be, I know people listening right now are going to be like, I want to, you know, I want to connect with you and work with you, et cetera. What are the best places for them to, to do that, to connect with you? Okay. So the best place literally is to apply to work with me on my website. So my name is Quajo which my dad immigrated from Ghana. It's not your standard English name. My website is spelled phonetically. That would be Q-U-A-Y-J-O.com. 
Q-U-A-Y-J-O.com. And when you head there, you'll see a couple of options. One is just to hop on like an hourly ads coaching session with me and I can get you started. We can set up ads literally over Zoom. Tell me your goal and I'll give you the best campaign structure I know how and tell you some pitfalls to avoid. Or you can apply to actually have me manage your ads for you. Either way, go to quajo.com. Q-U-A-Y-J-O. Dot com. Q-U-A-Y-J-O.com. Just going to go with Quajo, kind of like uh, Bono or <laughs> Tiger or Cher or something like that. I don't know why I just, I don't know why Cher just popped in my mind, but yeah. Q-U-A-Y-J-O. <laughs> Do you believe in love after life? Bro? <laughs> <Com. Love. laughs> I'll link it up in the show notes for today's episode. Quajo, my man, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hope you got a ton out of that conversation here with Quajo. Again, if you want to apply to work with him, he's just a really, really good Facebook ad manager. Go to Q-U-A-Y-J-O.com. It's his name phonetically spelled Q-U-A-Y-J-O.com. I'll link it up in the show notes for today's episode as well. And also, I'd love to hear your feedback on the show. If you've not yet left a rating review for the show over on Apple Podcasts, I would be super appreciative of you doing that. It literally takes like 10 seconds unless You want to write a paragraph for me, which I would love. I read all the comments there and I really, really appreciate it. It's a big help for the show. Make sure you hit subscribe wherever you listen to the show here so you don't miss any episodes. I appreciate you, my friend, for tuning in and coming to hang out with me. I don't take your attention lightly, so thank you. And until next time, be well. I'll chat with you soon. (laughs) 